Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Wine with Jimmy channel. I'm your host, Jimmy Smith. Thank you so much for stopping by. So this is a wine education channel for all your needs regarding things like the WSET certificates and other associated courses. On this series, we are talking about explaining wine terminology. So typical terms you may here and putting the um, detail and the science behind it so you can understand and then of course apply that to your studies and hopefully your examinations. As always if you have any comments or questions or concerns you can get in touch with me here by the social media you see at the bottom of every slide or by commenting on this video below on the world of YouTube or you can get in touch via info at winewithjimmy.com. Please use any of those channels. And if you are here on YouTube, make sure you click subscribe for weekly updates of wine education. So without further ado, look at what we're going through, the world of butter production. Just joking. We're looking at malolactic conversion here, uh, otherwise known as malolactic fermentation. A little bit of a misnomer or just mallow, uh, but we're going to call it malolactic conversion or MLC in this presentation. Very important process that occurs in many wines. We'll talk through that. It can um, change the style of the wine. Uh, it can ch uh, change the, the texture. And we'll need to know about how it happens, what is needed, uh, and how it is stopped if it's not desired and of course, all the resultant effects. So first of all, then let's talk about what it is. So what is malolactic conversion? So here you have an apple and you have some milk. So why do we have that? Well, malolactic conversion, like I mentioned, sometimes called malolactic fermentation or just mallow, is the result of lactic, ac lactic acid bacteria converting malic acid into lactic acid with some carbon dioxide given off for good measure. Um, also heat is produced at this point. So really it's called an, um, um, a fermentation, previously has been called a fermentation due to the carbon dioxide, which is given off and the heat as well, but it's actually more like a conversion, of course. Now, why is it called mallow and lactic? what is in that name well the etymology of that is that we have the word mallow mallow comes from malum l m m a l u m which is latin for apple and then the lactic bit well lactic uh, derives from lac l a c which is the latin for milk so this is apple to milk and that's why we have that picture just there. Uh, so it typically happens after alcoholic fermentation and occasionally during it. Now, I'm not talking about the fact that there actually are apples and they're being converted into milk. It's the acid behind these. So the malic acid typically associated with green apples and then the lactic acid, which is typically associated with milk, for example. Some winemakers prefer to promote malolactic conversion at the same time as alcoholic fermentation. Uh, and that's because some studies have actually uh, shown that it can increase the fruity characteristics, um, which therefore won't detract from the fine wine style. And it reduces production time, saving money, as the wines can, of course, be sold, uh, made and sold earlier. OK, so it's all about sort of logistical and convenient standpoint if they are going to practice this during the alcoholic fermentation. Now, certain conditions encourage this to happen. So slightly warmer temperatures around 18 to 22 degrees Celsius, that's 64 to 72 Fahrenheit, a moderate uh, potential of hydrogen, a, a moderate pH of around 3.3 to 3.5 and a low total SO2 will really help promote LAB, the lactic acid bacteria, which I'm going to talk about on the next slide. So historically, it often happened spontaneously in the spring following harvest as the temperatures would begin to rise in the cellar. 
Now the process can be started by adding the cultured lactic acid bacteria, LAB, lactic acid bacteria, and making sure that the optimum conditions, which are just listed just there, are adhered to. Uh, okay, so let's mention this LAB then, this lactic acid bacteria, which instigates malolactic conversion. So there's a bit of a picture of uh, Enococcus ini, uh, which is the major one that we'll talk through. So these lactic acid bacteria, now this is the group name for them, L-A-B, uh, and the, the bottom there you see Enococcus ini is the major strain, and then we have Lactobacillus, Pediococcus, and Leuconostoc as well. But we're just going to be talking about uh, really the major one which is highlighted there at the top. So these are present in the vineyard on the grapes, much like the yeast species, of course, what we call ambient yeast or wild yeast that carry out wild or spontaneous fermentations. There are four types of LAB, lactic acid bacteria, which are all listed at the bottom of your slide. So the main one, of course, is Enococcus ini. Um, then there are 12 species of Lactobacillus, there are three species of Pediococcus, and then there's one single species of Lycanostoc, uh, the last one on that list. Now, the microbial population tends to decrease somewhat at crushing, and that's due to the hostile, the increasingly hostile conditions that are being found there of acid and sugar. Uh, and of course, yeast is very much adapted at dealing with that acid and that sugar. And of course, that carries out a fermentation. But LAB finds that a little bit too hostile or maybe toxic may be the right word. And the addition of sulfur dioxide plus this toxic environment and plus the fact that some yeast strains that will actually act to ferment the juice uh, will release antimicrobial substances. So this means that it actually becomes an environment which is not positive for LAB and certain things might need to happen to create the environment that is necessary for it. Okay, uh, so that is lactic acid bacteria with the major strain being Enococcusini, as you see at the bottom of your slide. So we just mentioned this a little bit. Now, certain conditions then, I, I mentioned it briefly on the last slide, but let's go through it in a bit more detail. Certain conditions will stop, inhibit malolactic conversion. Uh, these are temperatures which are too cold, so below 15 degrees Celsius, that's 59 degrees Fahrenheit a lower pH, which is meaning generally a, a quite acidic environment uh, for LAB to survive, and then moderate, so increased amounts of sulfur, free sulfur that we find, and that will also inhibit the LAB from actually converting. Um, now, if winemakers are not too confident that those conditions are in place, potentially the fermentations are running a bit higher, uh, maybe you're looking at extraction of red wine, for example, the pH level, maybe you're from an area where the geology or the climate means that, in fact, your pH levels are more moderate, even higher. Uh, and sulfur dioxide, maybe you're in a natural environment where you are not liking to use much sulfur dioxide, then there may be another way of inhibiting malolactic conversion. And this is by the addition of something called an enzyme, which is lysozyme, as you'll see here. So that's just this uh, here. Sorry, let me get my proper pointer out, but this one uh, just here, so lysozyme. Uh, and uh, this will kill the lactic bacteria. Um, and it basically will mean uh, that you will, of course, have no um, malolactic conversion occurring after that point. So that's important to look at. Now, it is permitted in most countries of winemaking around the world. It's uh, something in the EU, for instance, which is allowed. Uh, so that enzyme has been given the go ahead to be used to add to wine to kill off lactic acid bacteria. Um, alternatively, lactic acid bacteria can be filtered out 
Uh, and this will uh, avoid, of course, once again, malolactic conversion taking place. So we've talked about uh, what it, malolactic conversion is, um, lactic acid bacteria, and then how to stop it. Uh, now we're going to talk a little bit about what styles will go through malolactic conversion. So here is, in fact, your very simple screen here. Now, red wines will routinely go through malolactic conversion, often because it is seen that uh, really the, the characteristic that the malic acid brings to a wine is often you know, exceptionally sharp and tart and green. And it's often something which can be a little bit of an unbalancing factor in most red wine. So red wine will nearly always go through it. Now, as far as I can think of off the top of my head, the only wine style uh, that doesn't tend to go through it as a red is the red wines that are made in the Vino Verde DOC in northern Portugal. Uh, where they are made in an exceptionally low alcohol fresh style with a little bit of spritz, a little bit of pétillance, and they retain their malic compounds, which gives them this kind of greenish edge, which is typical of our green wine, Vino Verde. Um, but of course, that is a penny in the vast vinous ocean. So really not a, uh, a significant production. So nearly all red wines. And then for whites, it, of course, is a winemaker's choice whether they want to go through malolactic conversion. It may be that the winemaker is producing a wine style which is exceptionally fresh and linear with lots of green freshness to it. And it's pretty much centered around that green character, the apple, the pear, and maybe even herbaceous characteristics. Now, malolactic will be avoided in those instances. But with some wines, of course, that are going to have some fleshing out and roundness and body, malolactic conversion may occur. And this is something which is not always completely carried out. So there can be a certain percentage, maybe a certain percentage of the barrels have gone through it where a certain percentage hasn't before. So, of course, you can have percentages of malolactic conversion as well. Now, what kind of vessel does malolactic occur in? So some winemakers choose to conduct malolactic conversion in barrels for both white and red wines rather than big vats or big stainless steel vats. The advantage of doing malolactic conversion in a barrel is the ability to be able to stir the lees at the same time to promote better integration of the secondary flavors which are derived from maturation. So, of course, these are things like Lee's yeast autolysis, as well as, of course, malolactic conversion characteristics. OK, um, however, this, of course, is more work. It's more time spent at doing this batonnage plus the malolactic. Uh, and also barrels may be at different temperatures, so we'll need individual monitoring. So that means that there needs to be a strategy and a team approach to actually dealing with all of the individual barrels. So that's more time, more work, more cost. <clears throat> the results of malolactic conversion. So um, what happens? Now, we're going to talk about a number of things here, but here are some more scientific characteristic effects within the wine. So first of all, there is a rise in pH. So the pH shift often means that there is an increase of about 0.1 to 0.3 pH, so an increase. So that can actually be quite significant, certainly when you're looking at uh, generally more moderate or higher pH wines anyway. So pH levels can shift upwards the acidity levels shift downwards. So there is a reduction in the acidity. And all of this is because lactic acid is weaker than uh, the acid of malic. So lactic is much weaker. And that's where that reduction in acidity comes from. Now, this may be a desirable characteristic. Maybe you want to get rid of that acidity. Maybe you want to rise the pH a little bit. 
And that's maybe in styles that are overtly acidic due to the climate they're found in. For example, cool climate Chardonnay in Chablis, for example. Uh, but not all wines, of course, will go through this due to the fact that um, some may be lower in acidity always. So, of course, it will be very full hardy to practice this if your acidity levels are a little bit low. OK, um, <clears throat> the other thing to note, men mention here on, on this little slide, of course, converting the acid into a softer sort of acid. So malic to lactic creates a, a wine that has a bit more of a mouthfeel, a textural characteristic behind it, often said to be softer or smoother in style. And remember that this can also happen in conjunction with Lee's contact, which also has a textural element to wines, adds a textural element through the contact with the manoproteins found in the dead yeast cells. So both of these together are said to create that kind of body and that mouthfeel. And you'll know this from your WSET um, tastings or any kind of tastings. Once you start listing things like bread, and dough and biscuit and brioche under lees, and then things like cream, milk, and butter under uh, malolactic. Now these will often then help you decipher the body as being a bit greater because they do add that textural compound to the wine style. Uh, more results here is that there can be some color, color loss in red wines. Uh, this is generally not an issue if, of course, extraction is fairly consistent. Uh, but in pale wines, colour loss can be a bit of an issue, of course. Um, now, one thing here is that we have greater microbial stability. So if the wine goes through malolactic conversion when in the winery, uh, and that's during or after fermentation. This, of course, means that it will, won't go through it in the future. And that means it won't go through it in bottle. So in some instances, this is possible, which could create, of course, very unwanted flavors if you have spontaneous malolactic conversion happening. Uh, that is undesirable. However, in cases where the pH of the wine is already quite high, so maybe late threes or in, in the fours, raising the pH slightly by practicing malolactic will make the wine more vulnerable to spoilage organisms. Uh, and this is because it creates a less toxic environment for bacteria and spoilage organisms such as Brettanomyces. Uh, and that's really because you're creating a nice, refreshing environment for those organisms, you know, where the pH is uh, actually higher and the acidity is generally lower. So it becomes a better ground for them to be in. Uh, OK, so that is if you are creating, you already have a very high pH or a high pH level wine at that point. Um, more results here in terms of modifying the flavour. So this is a rather complex area and it's still quite far from being fully understood. Um, there may be a slight loss of fruity character, the fruity esters, um, with the increasing amounts of secondary areas such as butter cream or cheese, as you can see there, notably in white wines, of course. Um, now, I put that up there. There's a picture of cream, there's butter in the background, there's milk. But here you'll see is the secondary aromas and flavors uh, tasting section. And you'll see here that malolactic in the middle, it actually is called MLF. Remember, that is another way of saying MLC. That's what you're looking at, butter, cream or cheese, which is often quite interlinked with above it which is yeast and that's the autolytic characters. And then because it often happens in oak, you'll often find it's interlinked with the one below it. So it's often, it's not always, but it's often all or nothing in that category. Uh, it's quite typical, but it's not always uh, like that. Okay. Um, also, lactic acid bacteria can also help release, and this is something that's being studied quite a lot recently, but it can help release positive flavor compounds from their precursors, which are available in the grape, but don't actually have any aromatic capability until 
they go through fermentation or winemaking like this MLC. And an example of that is like the floral smelling monoterpenes, for example. Um, now we have another area here as well. So the process of malolactic conversion can also increase volatile acidity, VA as at the bottom, uh, by the degradation of the citric acid, which is a very minor acid found in grapes and therefore in wine. This process therefore can also produce diacetol. And diacetol is a major issue for malolactic conversion because of its intense sensory effects. It yields the smells of things like buttered popcorn and yogurt. So you can find that diacetol can be often exceptionally intense on a wine style. You find this sometimes in beers as a beer fault as well. Um, and some people like it, you know, when you get a big buttery style Chardonnay, sometimes that buttered popcorn element is desirable. But if it overtakes the wine and, and really unbalances it against its fruity and floral compounds, then it really should be seen as a problem. Uh, it should be seen as an unbalancing uh, characteristic. Now, um, VA and especially diacetol rather, diacetol is mostly carried out by the lactic acid bacteria Pediococcus and also Lactobacillus, which have three and 12 strains respectively. And this is at higher pH levels. So often above 3.5, where you also have a quicker rate of MLC occurring. And another one that I wanted to mention here as well, which is really about some other um, compounds that are produced, which have effects on the human race. So this is the production of biogenic amines, as you'll see at the bottom here. So lactic acid bacteria can sometimes make the biogenic amines histamine, for example, ethylamine, amongst many others. The production really depends on the certain type of strain of lactic acid bacteria, but they are classed as a health concern to many consumers with symptoms ranging from nausea to hot flashes and, of course, to headaches. And even I've heard things like rashes as well. The production of these biogenic amines, like histamine, for example, is worst in wines with higher pH levels. So you may know somebody that often has a reaction to wine and people often immediately associate it to uh, additives such as sulfur. Uh, but it's probably more likely to be your biogenic, biogenic amines uh, in, in this instance. And to be honest, often it's the alcohol. But that's a story for another day. So that is malolactic conversion complete. I do hope that it's given you some good, solid understanding for this process. Um, I mentioned at the start that this is actually quite good for those of you taking your level three or above for WSCT. Um, now, you won't need to go into nearly anywhere near this amount of detail for level three, but certainly you will for level four. But it still gives you a wonderful understanding. And you're able to then, of course, freely talk about this topic when you are going to be, be put under the gun, as it were, for the examination. As always, if you do have any comments or questions or concerns, you can get in touch with me by the comment section below this video, the social media you see at the bottom of every slide, or direct at info at winewithjimmy.com. If you do find yourself in the United Kingdom, then please do come and see me. You know I have a bar and school, so come and see me for a class, a glass, or a bottle. I've been Jimmy Smith and see you very soon. Goodbye!